1,300 miles southeast of Syria, in Yemen, another colossal humanitarian catastrophe has unfolded. Aid groups there have struggled and failed to keep up with the desperate needs of victims of Yemen's expansive war. And unlike Syria, large numbers of Yemenis have not fled the country. They are locked in by geographical boundaries and no financial means to escape. The conflict and its victims have been remarkably invisible to the rest of the world. <laughs> Muhammad is one of millions of children whose lives have been turned upside down by the conflict. His parents rushed him to a nearby hospital after the airstrike. But he was turned away because there weren't enough doctors at the facility, and the area was bombarded by shelling and aerial attacks. He had to travel hundreds of kilometers to finally receive care in Yemen's capital. The country's healthcare system, which was already fragile, has been in near collapse since the war broke out in 2015. Shown here at a rally with its supporters, the Shia rebel Houthi movement took control of Sana'a in September of that year, and then grabbed other sections of the country. The group's offensive ultimately led sitting Yemeni president Abdurrabu Mansur Hadi to flee to Saudi Arabia. The Houthis are accused of drawing support from Iran. Their objective is to return ousted dictator Ali Abdullah Saleh to power. Forces loyal to President Hadi have been trying to beat the Houthis into submission with heavy air support from Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, oftentimes indiscriminately killing civilians or injuring them with severe burns from bombings. That Gulf coalition has received weapons and targeting support from the United States. In May 2017, the United States signed a $110 billion defense deal with Saudi Arabia, its principal objective to counter Iranian influence and promote regional security. It also included support for the Saudi aerial campaign in Yemen. In the meantime, the U.S. conducts its own strikes on Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula or AQAP, which controls several pockets inside Yemen. These strikes and other counter-terror actions have at times caused civilian casualties. As the war and the battle against militants has escalated, the nation has become even more splintered. It is deeply divided by tribe. And within many areas, this creates insecurity to the point where it's almost impossible for outsiders to move. So take a country which was almost at the poverty line or below it for much of its population. How long does it take before you have a massive humanitarian impact? The answer, not long at all. According to UNICEF, the number of citizens needing humanitarian assistance in Yemen has surged to 70% of the country's population many receive nothing. The toll hits children especially hard. By the spring of 2017, nearly 500,000 were severely malnourished. Many passed away from starvation. 15 million Yemenis have been also shut off from health care access. That's more than half of the country's population. What the medical facilities throughout Yemen should stop being targeted and that medical supplies should be allowed to come in here and be given to the people and the, the, the patients in this, this uh, facility who need them. Repeated pleas from the international humanitarian community have had no significant impact. We're seeing 
organizations and clinics being targeted by everybody. Now we hear quite a bit about the Saudi attacks on, on uh, clinics and hospitals, but the Houthis are doing pretty much the same. We don't hear about it that much. But there's absolutely no respect for organizations, for humanitarian principles. Ascertaining whether a health center has been deliberately targeted is exceedingly difficult in the midst of violent chaos and a terribly neglected health infrastructure. However, the numbers remain alarming. UNICEF reports 93 attacks on Yemen's hospitals from March 2015 to December 2016. Aid buildings have also been hit, including this one, which belonged to the International Medical Corps in the city of Taiz. The US-based organization has committed to staying in Yemen, despite having its staff injured and even abducted by rebels and held for days before release. Giorgio Trombatori was the IMC's country director in Yemen until June 2017. We spoke to him before his departure as he and his colleagues struggled through daily hazards to deliver services to desperate Yemenis. The country is totally disconnected with the entire world, completely. The, the impact on the situation is, uh, is massive. Coastal blockades are as equally devastating to the humanitarian situation as airstrikes. The Gulf Coalition has deliberately blocked the movement of food, fuel, emergency relief and medicines through Yemen's major port cities. Even if aid does enter the country, there are countless other barriers to clear. And the movement is crazy in Yemen. Whatever you move around Sana, you see destroyed buildings, there's a lot of checkpoints, there's a lot of uh, challenges and limitations. If you want to move from, uh, from Sana, when I regularly go to Hib, you can go through like maybe 100 checkpoints. Can you imagine if you are a, a businessman moving with your trucks and in every checkpoint you need to pay, you, need to, you lose time, hours, and you need special, uh, special permissions. Guys, okay, no problem. Even the movement of a basic uh, need like a drug, it is a nightmare. You need authorization. We had the situation where we sent drugs you know, to HIP and then they were uh, confiscated. Uh, you need sometimes you're dealing with in checkpoints with uh, young soldiers that they don't even know how to read that they, they want to uh, to maybe to you know to show their uh, their uh, their authority by hindering your work in the summer of 2017 the humanitarian catastrophe ballooned even further with an explosion of cholera Yemen's cholera outbreak is unlike anything we have seen in the modern era. Over half a million cases, over 2,000 fatalities. These are astronomical numbers. This is what you get when war destroys health, water, and sanitation systems, and when people stop being paid as the state implodes. The World Health Organization, the World Bank, and UNICEF have recently mobilized to bring assistance to Yemen but they face the reality of continued political and military stalemate. They face the reality that Yemen is a cage. Trombatori says Yemenis have lost hope. And you have a population which I think in the last two years, I, they don't even know anymore what to expect. There's a, there is a civil war, there is an international war, you have militants. I think when you speak with the people, there is a, a general sense of, uh, of loss. Although the humanitarian crisis is largely off the minds of the American public, it has sparked a significant pushback in Washington by some Democratic and Republican lawmakers who question the U.S.'s role in the Saudi-led military offensive. The impending famine in Yemen may reach biblical proportions. Think about that. It's astounding what's going on there, and it's being done without your permission, but with your weapons. The Saudis are deliberately trying to create a famine inside Yemen in order to essentially starve the Yemenis to the negotiating table. You saw a very heated debate in the Senate trying to block the precision-guided munitions. You had uh, almost half the Senate 
coming out against the sale of, of these munitions. And that is a remarkable sea change. It has to do not only um, with a question of regional dynamics, but it has to do with what's been happening on the ground, the absence of any accountability, the absence of an acknowledgement that all these civilians are dying, and that that actually might not be in the interest of the United States and the coalition long term. Proponents of the larger arms deal to the kingdom argue that several hundred millions of dollars dedicated to the training of Saudi forces and radar systems will curtail civilian casualties. That's, of course, just one aspect of the increasingly complex landscape of the war in Yemen, as Washington continues to debate its own role. We cannot become Russia. We cannot sacrifice international humanitarian law to raw security interests, nor can we retreat. U.S. leadership remains essential. We need to guarantee our own security interests while pressing the Saudis to protect civilians, while pressing the parties in Yemen for a political resolution, and while urging expanded humanitarian access. Yemen should not be forgotten 